What up, Goat Flippers? Thanks for checking out the Van Flip Podcast, the number one metal and hardcore podcast out there. It's your host, Lurk, and I hope you made millions off of investing in GameStop and whatever else you Robin Hood kids are doing with Wall Street bets. If you're just checking this podcast out for the first time, that's cool. Welcome to the show. You should check out some of our other shows. We had some pretty interesting guests on thus far, bringing us up to episode number 43 here. Check out lambgoat.com for all your metal and hardcore news. Like Lambgoat on Facebook, and you can also follow them on Twitter and Instagram at Lambgoat. Subscribe to Lambgoat on YouTube, and you can check out all these episodes in video format plus other Lambgoat content. If you're listening to us on a platform that you can rate and review us, please do so. It helps us out immensely in the podcast algorithm. And go ahead and share an episode with your friend. And if you want to follow me, I'm on Twitter and Instagram at LurkCity. So a cool little backstory on this week's episode. One of our listeners requested this guest, so uh, I reached out and got it situated and everything like that. But the weird thing is, is I had been listening to his band CD previously the last couple of weeks because I kind of like was reminiscing about uh, bands from 2000, early 2000s. So oddly enough, we were able to get this person on in a short period of time. So, um, you know, you can find all of our guests' links in the description, as well as all of Lamb Goat's links, as well as all of my links, and uh, links to our Spotify playlist and everything like that. So yeah, let's enjoy the stroll down memory lane, guys. Oh yeah, what's this? I feel this. Oh yeah, this is uh Oh no, oh, no, no, no. Lamb Goat presents the Van Flip Podcast. Thanks for checking out this episode of Lamb Goat's Van Flip Podcast. I want to welcome Wesley Isolt. You might know him from bands such as American Nightmare, Some Girls, Cold Cave, Exoskeletons, and probably many more, I'm sure. Uh, Wesley, welcome to the show. How you doing, man? I'm okay. Thanks for having me. Good, good, man. Are you still out in the West Coast in uh, California? Yeah, I've been in Los Angeles for like nine or ten years. Oh, cool. Which is like a long time for me to stay anywhere. So it's my world record. <laughs> um, how's, yeah. how's the weather out there? Cause it's finally getting kind of chilly. I live in North Florida, so it's finally getting kind of, you know, Oh, right on. It's like 90. I don't know. It's, <laughs> it's, it's, it's strange. It's, it's a bad time to want to wear a winter jacket in February, but it's fine. Um, I don't know. It's, LA is bizarre right now. It changes daily, um, climate wise, and also like uh, I guess the so- social climate also. Oh, of so course. yeah, I wouldn't. You just wouldn't imagine. You never know what you're going to get. How is it over there? Being you know um, on the West Coast, specifically California. I know it's you know it's more left out there, and I live in Florida. And uh, when I talk to <clears throat> excuse me, when I talk to other bands that live in other parts of the country, it's always. Um, mm-hmm kind of interesting to find out what's going on in their little area where, you know, as it pertains to music or events or live music and stuff like that. So they're pretty strict over there, right? On the West coast. Um, yeah, I mean, I, it's for sure. I live in Hollywood, so yeah, it's more left leaning, but I would say at the end of the day, this place is just sort of a lot of people looking out for themselves. (laughs) So it's like, (laughs) Um, it's fine. I don't know. We, we kind of keep to ourselves. Like my partner who's in Cold Cape with me, she has a bookstore here in Hollywood. So we're kind of like just doing our thing day to day. And, um, with all the shutdowns and everything, we figured out a way to make it work. And, um, we're used to being on tour all the time. Mm -hmm. You know, we tour like nine months of the year or something for like, I've I've done that for like the last 20 years. So it's been strange being here. Um, it's like, you know, co- COVID cases here are surging. It's psychotic. But like, I think it's, it's also like, if you're just kind of relatively smart and safe about it and don't fixate on being inundated with awful news all the time, you know, mm-hmm. it's, you can kind of just carry on and uh, keep working on things you care about, you know. 
Yeah. Otherwise, it's just like you wind up with a headache for days and like the world's ending and, you know, we try not to go there. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we have a pretty big event tomorrow. I'm interested to see how that goes with the inauguration. Uh, so I'm interested to see <laughs> what happens all together. I, yeah. I know a lot of people are preparing for, you know, maybe the worst or hoping for the best, but uh, it'll be interesting either way. So I'm for peace. Yeah. I want peace. Uh, of course. <laughs> I yeah. want peace for everyone and to be left alone from everyone. Right. Exactly. Uh, so let's switch gears here and we'll talk about some music. You were talking about touring and stuff like that. Um, American Nightmare. I've never, Go ahead. I don't know. I don't know if I meet the criteria for this podcast because I've actually never been in a flipped van. Mm, no. I've been, in a, <laughs> I've been in a van that was like, I woke up because someone was screaming and my head was asleep against the window and out the window I could see the road a foot or two from me because a driver fell asleep at the wheel and like just veered off the edge of a highway and we were just driving sideways for a while. Like if you would have driven by our van, <clears throat> this is on a Sun Girls tour, if you would have driven by our van, you just would have seen a vehicle with like eight people asleep in it, including the driver. <laughs> um, we survived and the driver blamed it on the wind or something like that. Yeah, that can yeah. happen, you know, depending on what... Where, <clears throat> was it uh daytime nighttime this was in the middle of the night <clears throat> my you know driving through the middle of nowhere like wyoming or something just on a long long stretch of nothing and wind and nothing to keep you excited yeah i was gonna say that's like boring country out boring country out there no offense to those who live there but <clears throat> there's nothing really to look at it's pretty flat and boring you know Good sunsets. Yeah, I mean, it, it's good if you like clouds and sunsets and sunrises and stuff like that. But uh, it's pretty. Yeah, it can get pretty mundane on the road. You know, when you're traveling through there. Yeah. Well, I survived. Yeah, you toured a lot. So, what what is your favorite things about you know touring? Uh, and what is your favorite project to go touring with? Um, you know, as as you've gotten older. Oh, definitely Cold Cave. Um, <laughs> <laughs> not as rough I mean, as it used to be uh, but you know that's like relative to my age now and um, probably more of my interest but there was really amazing things about touring with American Nightmare 20 years ago and even to this day um, I don't know I mean you know 20 years ago it was incredible to just meet people all over and stay at people's houses yeah. now I prefer my alone time but um <laughs> um what do you think change, what do you think changes with that just age and just wanting to be you know more reclusive or you know the wanting the wanting to be something and the passion of just wanting to be something as a young you know young individual i think yeah it's a little of all that like i think it's also just like you burn out you get burn out as you get older because you're just trying so hard a lot you know most of the time i don't know if it's if it's that it's just more the communal aspect comes more with, with hardcore than, than what I'm doing now. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I was thinking about, about it earlier like prior to talking with you, because like, I remember growing up being when I still with my parents, like age 16 touring bands would stay at my parents' house. Yeah. I would just say, Hey, like these people I kind of know need somewhere to stay. Is it okay if they stay there? And my parents were super cool about it. Um, and then on a tours, that was just what you did. You know, that's what hardcore bands do and, and did. You just always stayed somewhere. And this doesn't really make sense now that I'm older because you'd end up driving an hour or two to and from to get to someone's house where you could have just <laughs> right. got one hotel room for the same price as the guest. Right, right. But like, that's just what you did. I think even when doing that, um, I still... I enjoyed it, but was always sort of looking for my uh, little place of solace in the corner of some weird apartment. Yeah, to try to get these two. I think just um, I don't know being able to afford to do that now, and uh, I, I think like isolation has a price. <laughs> no, yeah, for sure. <laughs> that you can only, 
as you get older, you can afford it sometimes. Yeah, of course. And, you know, it's, we were just talking about it on the last podcast uh, with, there were just some younger guys that are in a you know, more, uh, an up and coming band, but, you know, they're, we were talking about just being with the same people because they recorded an album during COVID and they had to like quarantine and stay in their van the entire time. And uh, it was crazy, you know, because you, yeah. you get worn with the people that you're with day after day after day after day. And then you throw traveling into it and it can get pretty hectic. And especially when you're like having to meet random people all the time, stay at random people's houses. It can just be like a lot. But as an older person, that would be like, I don't know, the worst thing to probably endure, you know, <laughs> but you, uh, you, love, you kind of you kind of love it as a, as a younger person. Yeah, I mean, it's pretty dark now if you're, <laughs> you know, <laughs> 40s begging for somewhere to stay, but go, <laughs> go for it. For sure. Um, but that was like a cool thing about all that too. I don't know, just how like actually sort of kind and trusting people are within that world, mm-hmm. you know, for sure. And, um, for the most parts with no problems, you know? Well, that's the, that's one of the draws. I think, well, it was one of the draws for me for, to hardcore was the community of the, uh, the whole thing. And like, I guess you could, I don't want to like say it's like, I guess I guess call it like boy scouts. Like there's a camaraderie in boy scouts or like gangs or any kind of click. Like there was a big, you know, sense of camaraderie and like, you know, not quote unquote brotherhood, but like, it was it was like a cool place. Yeah, it's for fraternal in a way. You're growing up. You're growing up with people who have similar interests. You know. Yeah. I know what you mean. I know what you mean. Um, it's weird you don't have that. I mean, I guess you do have that in ways in other you know genres, but it's it seems part of the you know the fabric of hardcore or just the yeah. It's, in it's the way you can see someone twenty years later that you haven't seen in forever and still like hug them hello. You yeah. know. Yeah. I don't know. So you guys, uh, you guys released your latest last year during COVID um, with uh, through death through death wish. Uh, did you guys do you guys did you have any plans on supporting that album live, or was that just kind of like a casual release for, with American Nightmare? Well, you know, we did in like a full length. I guess almost two years ago now, and we toured on that. And then last, about a year ago, we released Life support. just a, sing- a single and like a reissue of the year one compilation. And then um, we were actually on tour when shit started breaking. And um, like our last show, tour was canceled. We made it through almost the whole tour and just the very last show in Los Angeles was canceled. But it started getting like kind of weird um, approaching the West Coast, like Colorado. Um, I was going home a lot in between shows because we had days off. And I remember flying back to um, Denver for the show. Mm-hmm. And it was, you know, people were in panic already in the airport. And that was late, like mid late, I guess late February. And then we had um, like another week or so of shows. And then our last show was supposed to be like March 12th. And that was canceled. But, you know, Seattle was bizarre. Portland was rad. Like, no one cared there. And then, like, <laughs> um, San Francisco, like, the show after ours was canceled. And I think the same in Seattle. Like, the show the next night was the last one they had in town. And then, um, yeah, that was it. So we were trying to make it through the tour to at least finish. But yeah. it was not to be... And that was our that was our twenty year anniversary tour, which is a bummer. <laughs> it's a, it's like accurately appropriate for that yeah. band, so it's fine. <laughs> um, what when you guys got back together in two thousand eleven? What changed to where you could use the name? Did the um, did the rights run out on it from the other band and the the other Philadelphia band? Yeah, it's like they had they never really had it it just disappeared and like you know there were still like releases like the, i think like the demo seven inch was still in print the whole time underneath the name american nightmare and so we always kind of had the name being used in some form uh even when we weren't performing live and so um you know when we got back together we built it 
I think is American Nightmare and give up the ghost and just sort of use the logo. And then as we wanted to start doing more and releasing more music, uh, I just got the name like actually trademarked for the first time as opposed to just like using it since like 99 or whatever. Mm -hmm. Um, it was a total headache every time, but it worked out, you know, I think they call that adulting. Adulting is headaches. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it definitely <laughs> is for sure. Um, so we're in Florida. If you live. I live in North Florida, uh, Jacksonville. I'm sure you've been here many a times or been through here. At uh, least. I went to sixth and seventh grade in Mayport. Oh my God. Did you really at Mayport middle? I guess so. Yeah. Oh my goodness. Um, I yeah, went I lived to on the, the rival on the high school. I went to the rival uh, middle school. Sucks for you. Yeah. What were you doing down here uh, at the time? Just uh, my father was stationed at the Navy base there. Oh, interesting. Cool. So, um, yeah, the um, middle school was right, right off the base. <clears throat> so, I was there sixth, seventh grade, interesting. and um, I liked it. Um, and I think we're almost around the same age. Uh, I'm 37, and I don't know how old you are. I'm, I'm 41. Okay, so maybe. So if it would have been like, unfair for us to compete yeah. at that time. <laughs> It'd been like high school maybe, but that doesn't seem likely. But It's fucked up. I remember like at my school, <clears throat> I don't know if you remember this or if it was still happening, but to me it blew my mind because I was, I was moving every year or two, but at that school in Florida, if you got in trouble, you got these things called SWATs. And what that was was the vice principal hitting you with a stick. <laughs> um, and I, I couldn't believe in like whatever it was, like I guess 89-ish, that 90, that that was still a thing. It just seems so backward at the time. Yeah. I think we had it in, we had it in our middle school too. And I think maybe even in our high school. Like, like a paddle or some shit, like the old school paddle. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. It was, uh, I think it was like, uh, like a last resort type thing. I don't know how that worked, but I never, our school I never just like got threw it. them out like regularly. And I remember like, I, I got it once <laughs> and it was just like my friends and I, I don't know why, like we were probably like skating or something, like something so arbitrary and gotten uh, trouble for that. And we got swats and my friends were just like, Oh dude, you just, you just put like a shirt or like, paper towels in your pants and you just do it and it, you don't feel it and it was like this is so fucking stupid we did that and just laughed through it and um surely that doesn't seem like something that should be legal no is, i mean uh, i don't think they're an older man an older man hitting a 11 12 year old kid in the ass no, doesn't I, seem like a I thing but, but florida has its own way you know and i shouldn't judge it well we are we are a little bit wilder down here you know there's a lot of people that just end up here so People who are willing to travel long distances usually end up here, so we get more crazy individuals just mating with other crazy individuals. And next thing you know, Florida's just crazy. I like it. Yeah. Plus, you know, the 70s and all the cocaine in Miami and stuff like that. So it is what it is. Um, I like it. So oddly enough, you were like a request from uh, from our audience to kind of reach out and get you on uh, – and the thing that was funny is a couple of weeks ago, I repurchased uh, the Give Up the Ghost, um, We Are the uh, Underground uh, CD at um, the guy from Bain. Uh, his, uh, he opened up, a, the bassist from Bain opened up a record shop here, James, Tiger Records. And uh, I guess someone had traded in there, Give Up the Ghost CD, and I purchased it because I had... I remember like I had my own webzine way back in the day when I was in high school and or right after high school and that album came out and it, they sent it to me and Equal Vision sent it to me to like review or whatever. So it was like a nostalgic type thing. And then, yeah, they requested you on. So I thought, oh, yeah, that'd be cool. <laughs> so I'm glad it worked out. Crazy. Yeah. Um, that was an album. Yeah. It definitely was an album. So when you, um, what got you kind of into doing Cold Cave? Uh, was it just to kind of explore a different musical realm? Because 
it, you know, your, your other projects kind of are in the vein of like hardcore for the most part. Yeah. Uh, so what gave, yeah, I what mean, gave you the choice of uh, the idea to do that? Well, it kind of went from like, I did American Nightmare and then Some Girls. And then I was sort of at this point where I was like basically just tired of relying on other people to write music for me to sing on. Mm-hmm. And um, that's when I started that project called Exoskeletons, which was just sort of the, the first savage of that was just sort of like really short punk songs to drum machine. And um, I liked it. I liked being independent and just had all these ideas and energy and didn't want to wait around for other people. Um, I just sort of like half hazardly did that for a little bit. And then I moved out of San Diego and was living in Philadelphia at the time. And um, I had just started sort of gathering different equipment, like different pedals and synthesizers and drum machines. And um, I was just trying to make sort of abstract music and I failed at it and started making sort of more synth-based kind of new wave pop songs. And I liked it. It was sort of ingrained in me as that was my first love of music growing up. And I never stopped listening to the bands that were influential to Cold Cave. And um, it just worked. I enjoy it. And I think I'm good at it. And it was great to finally establish myself as not just someone who was waiting around for uh, other people. You know, American Nightmare was around for initially only like four years and um, it was two LPs and two seven inches, essentially some girls were sort of lagging. Um, by the time I left San Diego, nothing was really happening with it. And I had no plans in life ever, but to be a part of music and write and um, nothing else ever crossed my mind. Um, I never doubted it for a second. I never had uh like any sort of delusional dreams about my place in it or like how popular i should be or want to be and i just never had a problem starting over from ground zero with a new band and so i was like okay now is my time to do another band like these bands ran their course and now i'm gonna do this and i think there was a sort of sincerity throughout those bands, but particularly with Cold Cave that translated to people and has somehow sort of elongated into the longest consistent running band I've done, Mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. Uh, Did you, when you, when you create these other projects, is it tough to juggle between them? Specifically, I, I guess my, I'm referring to Cold Cave and American Nightmare because did when you started Cold Cave, were you thinking that maybe American Nightmare had maybe you know stopped and been shelved for you know for your life at that point, or did you kind of think later on down the line it it's possible that we could bring American Nightmare back, and how am I gonna do both of them you know yeah, well, I think at the time when I started it, definitely knew American Nightmare material was not something I was considering a possibility at the time. I was actually pretty adamant about that. And so that, that wasn't an issue, like confusing the two or trying to tap into different personalities and able to write lyrics per band or, or anything like that. And if anything, that would be a, an issue now or over the past few years as both bands continue to release music, but somehow it hasn't been. There's something about American Nightmare, uh, that I feel very fortunate enough to have this sort of reaction to the music where um, it really comes very naturally. Like something about the way those people play music gets me excited. And the idea of American Nightmare makes me excited. And words just sort of fall out and the song is done relatively fast every time. So, whereas cold cave can be a bit more laborious for me. And, um, I take more time with songs and I sit on a lot of music with cold cave. I have just 
songs and songs and songs that maybe will never see the light of day, as opposed to American Nightmare, we release pretty much everything that we complete, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. But they, they have their own voices and own responses to the music, really. Different crowds, too. Different crowds, too, but less than you may imagine, in a way, you know? Um, no, I'm finding, the, the, I'm finding, like, especially on the Lamb Goat message board, <laughs> they are big fans of, like, that kind of music, you know, that reverts back to, like, nods to the Smiths and Joy Division and all that kind of stuff. They they really like the 80s synth wave influence stuff. So they share a lot of, like, weird, uh, you know, off-the-wall type songs they find on uh, on Bandcamp and stuff. You should check it out sometimes. <laughs> but uh, it's crazy. <laughs> so I know there's a crossover for sure, but the, what I meant was those crowds take music in differently too. Yes, definitely. Um, but yeah, like you said, there are parallels also. Um, but I I always write lyrics and vocals, whatever, <clears throat> always to completed music. I never have an, a lyric idea or a melody or something that I want to try. Like, <clears throat> I'm a terrible person to write a song with. Over the years, people have tried and they've been like, give me a vocal idea. I don't, I don't have those. I don't come up with music that way. I'm only responsive to a nearly completed song. So yeah, um, I can understand that. In that way, they're pretty easy to keep separate because they elicit such different moods, you know? Yeah. Speaking of American Nightmare, not that we weren't earlier, but uh, why do you think background music has such a landmark, was such a landmark record for uh, many hardcore fans? Um, well, if it is, I think it would be because at the time there, there wasn't really anything that sort of straddled these separate scenes, like where we were coming from in Boston, we were coming from a place of more like sort of faster traditional styled hardcore bands, like in my eyes or tenor fight or in some ways Bane, not that they're totally traditional in, in that sense, but, um, and the bands like Ride Brigade and Fast Break, we were kind of like the band that came as those bands were sort of ending. And those were more like sort of mid, late 80s influence, straight edge bands. So I think and coming from that scene, but not having vocals that necessarily sounded like those bands gave it an immediate different life. Also sub subjectively like... Um, the bands we were surrounded by were like these really positive bands who were trying to um, promote good things in the world. And I wanted to die. So like, my lyrics were just totally different. <laughs> um, I think people related to that. And at the same time, you know, the, there's these different worlds and avenues of hardcore that were kind of operating by themselves, more like metal influence stuff and then more traditional sounding hardcore. And I think AN kind of bridged between the two bands, like, um, like you would have, it would have been basically unimaginable to think of any of those sort of bands. I just mentioned going on tour a few years later with someone like Poison the Well or 18 Visions. It just would have never happened, but somehow those crowds were really responsive to American Nightmare, even though we were coming from a different place. There was something that translated across those um, narrow streams of, hardcore that just sort of worked and i think you know when that album came out we went on a pretty great tour with converge and the hope conspiracy and i think there was just it was just like a new all by small era of hardcore that was sort of like non-traditional and doing its own thing you know yeah i get it and um you know Honestly, when you refer like Poison the Well and 18 Visions, you know, I could throw American Nightmare right in there too. I, when I look back at it <clears throat> personally, but that's just, you know. What yeah, I, that's I, cool. I think like, I think bec because you can do that, I mean, that's sort of, um, that's a cool thing about the band that it was able to perform with different bands. Like, you know, we, we, we toured with, we tore with like Kill Your Idols and then we tore with Glassjaw, you know, we're pretty Ooh, opposite bands. Anyway. 
That's my all-time you know? favorite band right there. Which one? Glassjaw. Oh, yeah. That tour was rad because it was... Um, I mean, it was Glassjaw, then us and Blood Brothers across the U.S. Nice. Um, it was a cool tour. Like, Glassjaw had just released, I guess, Worship and Tribute. And the crowds for them were massive. You know, they were like total rock stars in Texas, particularly. <laughs> we were, we'd go to the mall and people were like swarming them. It was really wild. <clears throat> was that like MTV days? I guess it must have been for them. <clears throat> it was. I mean, I don't know how much they had the video with, that Vincent Gallo was in. I don't know how much it was actually played, but for some reason, they just, people really connected with him in like that region yeah. of the country. Crazy warp tour and stuff, I guess. Yeah. Who knows? Um, I guess so. Yeah, yeah, totally. <laughs> How did you guys end up hooking up with Rise Records? Uh, well, Craig, who started that label and ran the label, I think until recently, I think he's gone now, but um, he put American Nightmare on a compilation he made. That I think it was on Rise actually in in like 2000. Like early on, he was in touch with the band and supportive. And then when people heard we were recording, we just started getting offers from different labels. And um, I don't know, they I don't know, they paid the most basically. Nice. What was and the without without they without like wanting anything from us we're like okay we want to record this album like by ourselves in our drummer's basement like okay yeah cool go ahead okay cool we want to make this video that will probably be a little too expensive for what the song is because the song's like 50 seconds long like oh yeah cool go ahead so it was just like okay <laughs> it seems easy which is a one-off record you know it wasn't, it wasn't like a huge record deal but <clears throat> they made it financially possible without any restrictions on it you know well, that seems like it's pretty flexible. So is that why uh, Life Support was released on Death Wish? Or are you still kind of working with Rise for full length? No, no, we're not on a label at all. Um, we are... Um, Death Wish was just like... Just asked them if they wanted to be a part of this new 7-inch. And they said, yeah. And, you know, Death Wish has been a, a label that sort of has been involved with... American Nightmare and other projects of mine since I started making music. So it's, it's sort of like a natural place that we like to go to. Um, like they've released music by AN, some girls, exoskeletons and cold cave. So. Is there any more Good. exoskeletons in the tank or, or have, we seen, <laughs> have we seen all of that? We've seen, I think we've seen all of that. <laughs> We get a lot of questions. That's that's one of the questions people wanted to ask if there's going to be any more of that coming up. That's funny. I mean, that band played, at, like, I don't know, maybe five or six shows, and they were mostly sort of parties or, like, hip-hop shows, you know? Um, Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. It was fun, but it it's, like, nice to do a band that you don't care about that much, you know? Mm -hmm. yeah. It's fun. It's really relieving. Um. So is the is there any more new American Nightmare? You said you put out everything you do when the, once you guys do it. Have you guys taken any time over the pandemic to maybe share ideas, start writing? Uh, or have you been yeah, focusing on other projects? We have. Um, we have. We have some songs unrecorded, but the music exists, and I'm sure it will probably see the light of day eventually it's sort of i think that in some ways the the pandemic has been a, a bit irrelevant to the songwriting process of american nightmare because it's pretty sporadic and happens every couple years anyway so um i don't i don't know we didn't like <laughs> make the most of this time but that's not <laughs> unusual either <laughs> Yeah. Well, you have I got, projects I'm pers too. Personally, I got tons of projects done. I released, um, I think next week I'm putting out two other books through my published company. So that's like four or five books in the past, you know, six or seven months. I have a new Cold Cave record coming out. 
and a bunch more that's near done. So, well, that was a question too. Uh, if Cold Case is going <laughs> to put something out here so- soon, or if that was in the works, soon, so soon. Um, I just like you know, it was like you you start feeling, a, whenever you're, I, for some reason, my natural reaction to people telling me what I'm should be doing makes me repel and go the other way. So it was like, you should release music and do a live stream. It was like, Ugh, no, I'm not going to, I can't. Not a live you know? stream guy? Guess not. <laughs> is it because of the, is, is, it, is it because of the <laughs> logistics of it? Or you just think like, no, nah, it's too much to handle or, or you it can da- put it down, down like tunes down. Yeah. <laughs> not a, not a live stream guy. Yeah. Comma guy. Yeah. It, what, so you just don't like you just don't like it, or you just it's too much to mess with. Well, like American Nightmare was approached about doing like performing background music because mm-hmm. that I it's guess the twenty year anniversary of that would technically be this year. Yeah, and I just I'd rather just wait, and if we decide to play that record live, I'd rather do it live. Um, I don't. So basically, what you're saying is you're holding out to see a show go on this year, and then maybe I'll just, yeah, I'll just, you're gonna, I'll just you're gonna announce a 20 year anniversary tour of where you just play that record full on. Is that who cares? Saying? I'll do a 21 anniversary tour. It doesn't. It's so arbitrary. I think, and just like <laughs> I don't want to force anything. I'm just like it just sounds like a bad idea. Everyone lives in a different city, so like flying to New York for everyone to congregate, we'd have to rehearse first and then play this record to no one i just seemed like um seemed, seemed kind of stupid i guess yeah i'm sure you'd have to like relearn uh what 90 percent of the album <laughs> I, I had to learn more like 10 percent of the album oh yeah. that stuff sort of like sticks with you but there's just like a couple songs in that record i think that we there's at least there's at least two songs we never mm-hmm. performed live so I don't think the band has ever even played them. So it'd be more like you have to just figure out how not to be bad on camera, you know? <laughs> yeah, for sure. So I don't mean to beat a dead horse or anything, but how did you find out about the fallout boy, uh, lyrics situation? Well, that's like a complicated subject where I, I can't say too much. <laughs> legally yeah so but basically um i don't know friends friends say you should listen to this check this out and um and then they you know they ended up hiring me to write songs on their next record so that was it was all it was all good so everything like you know worked out for the best between the two of you then huh no ill will. Yeah, I mean, no, no, no way. No ill will. I mean, that's perfect. To each their own. I'm for peace, like I said earlier. <laughs> <laughs> so it was basically like a nod, you know, a reference, a nod to the band, and we'll we'll call it. Sure. <laughs> um, Alex would like to know. He read online somewhere that you live in uh, the late actor Ruger Hauer's old house. Is that true? That is true. Interesting. I think I Googled him earlier because I think I read that too. Uh, but this was a couple of days ago. He was like an actor, correct? Yes, he was. I, I'm, not, I'm not super familiar with him, to be honest with you. Um, yeah, he's an awesome, awesome actor. He is in one of my favorite movies ever called Turkish Delight. But he's probably best known for Blade Runner. Mm, yes. Now I know who you're talking about. I remember Google. Yeah. And now, now I remember while I was Googling. Yeah. Yeah. How did that come about? You just kind of looked into that or? Um, no, I mean, just when we, just when we moved in, they told us what the deal with the history of the house was. Um, I live on this sort of tiny, tiny street in the, in the hills here that, um, that you can hardly fit a car down. Um, 
anytime someone who lives there tries to drive up there, they get stuck and a tow truck comes and their day is ruined. Um, but the street is, um, it's like, it's old Hollywood. So it's sort of like every house has a history there. Mm-hmm. That's just got lucky with Rucker Hauer as opposed to like Bill Cosby or something. I don't know. Right. Does that influence the price of the house depending on who lives in it? Uh, I think probably at times, but I don't know. I, I'm sure there are some inflation based on who lived in what house, you know. But Booker Howard is a little more, uh, a little more of a cult, cult figure. Yeah. Does he have anything? Did he have any like weird, weird things installed? And did you keep he, any of the weird things? <laughs> uh, well, in a way, like our second bedroom, <clears throat> which is our child's room, has like just like these really cool sh- shelves that he put in and um, we kept those, but it's like, it's kind of bizarre. It's like not, I think he must've used it for an office, but it's sort of like you wouldn't put those shelves in a room like that. And it's just sort of strange and they're stacked weird. And, um, but it's, it's lovely. There's a lovely garden. And um, my favorite thing is that you can't see the house, you know, it's, it's covered in, Ivy with these sort of old ornate walls and doors around it. So um, my, I can't imagine anything worse than someone knocking on my front door and that doesn't happen. So yeah, that'd be good. Pretty good. How is it being in Hollywood? Do you notice the, um, the amount, like, do you notice people leaving, like people flee, not fleeing, but like, you know, moving No, people are fleeing, for sure. <laughs> so you can, is fleeing it like noticeable is a, like that? Yeah, fleeing is a fine word to use right now. Um, yeah, it's like, particularly if two, three months ago, on the first of every month, you know, streets would just be lined with moving trucks and people are moving out. But it's starting to, I'm starting to see a lot more people move in also. Um Tons of businesses are just gone forever. Somehow we've done okay with our bookstore, mm-hmm. but um, it'll survive. Um, I don't know. You know, people people here tend to live outside of their means in terms of like getting a way overpriced house or getting like the most expensive car, and they're sort of like they get like an advance or a movie deal or they sell a script or something. And they think like it's going to continue on that way. And the same with bands, you know, you get like your, your that major level advance or something. And you just like, you think you're set, but it rarely works that way. So I think the majority of the people I saw moving were people just who are living beyond their means. So like what a lot of people were doing was abandoning these houses, these like, three, four, five, six, seven, eight million dollar houses in the hills and also trying to rent them out while they were for sale at the same time, just hoping for any income, you know? Yeah. So um, it's a bit more quieter, but it's still like pretty busy. But you don't personally have any thoughts of leaving California yourself? I don't know. I mean, I still... Um, I mean, there's things that are kind of annoying about it and there's a lot of problems in Los Angeles right now, but, um, I still, I still like it enough to, uh, farewell with the reality of it and romanticize it. So I'm fine with it. I don't know where else I would be. And I, it's, it's like nice having this anchor of a bookstore. I can walk to the store from our house, you yeah. know? So it's yeah. like, it's like our neighborhood, and uh, it's a good neighborhood to, to live in. How do you juggle the bookstore and uh, like touring, or does your partner, you know, mostly run the bookstore while you're gone and everything? No, she's <clears throat> she's in Colcave. Oh no, also, yeah, yeah, yeah. So no, no, she's, no, she's with you. So yeah, so how does that work? Just like, <clears throat> there's just you know there's employees and um, they run it when we're gone, so it has it hasn't been an issue. Um. But I don't know. It just it just sort of works out. It, you know, the bookstore has been here since like 1989, 1990. 
So it's sort of a neighborhood staple. She's owned it for a little over a decade. So it's cool. sort of just, um, it's cool. It's like tons of great books. and then also like a full sort of like imported magazine stand. So it's sort of like the one of the last standing magazine stands in Los Angeles. So it's like, if you live here and you're in a magazine, you want to get your magazine that you're in, this is where you would go get it, you mm-hmm. know? So the, a lot of the clientele is kind of like that. And then there's just also like really cool, like music and a, a cult and poetry and literature books here. So yeah, I'm picturing like a very niche, uh, you know, eclectic book. It is book. niche. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Do you, as a person in a band and, you know, in bands and in music uh, and a person who's involved in a bookstore, do you find the the want for physical media to be increasing as time goes on as before? I am, yeah. Yeah, it was, like a, it was like a lull when you could get everything like MP3 or like ebook and everything like that. So Totally, totally. I think it's, from my perspective, it's definitely increasing. Um, a few years ago when I'd be hanging around here, it wasn't uncommon to hear someone come in and be like, magazine who the fuck wants a magazine and <laughs> yeah. like, i can remember what? Those days. now it's like we can't keep stuff like that in stock you know and like um certainly a large portion of things we have here are probably available online and it seems to be sort of irrelevant to people as time goes on um i think people got burnt out on it and are looking for something to um not only to hold, but to sort of like, for me, like when I am careful about the the books and records I buy, because I'm thinking about how they're going to be like occupying actual space of mine in my home. So I want to be surrounded by only things I actually will find inspiring. And I think that's a thing that people have sort of come to, particularly during the pandemic is that everyone's like trying to make their home or like where they live a nicer place, right. To be more inspiring. And so you don't go out as much. And, um, I think, so there's that aspect. And then there's also, I think people are remembering that reading is a good thing to do and not just be glued to like some app on your phone and getting inundated with like quick information. Um, I think if anything, this has sort of taken people back a bit, where they're able to find the time in their lives. It's not so hectic being in a city like this. And they're able to just sort of set aside time to sit on it and read something. And um, it's really cool to see that actually. Yeah. You know, I, I can't believe like, you know, a lot of the books we have here are like pretty obscure books and um, people keep taking them home with them, you know? <laughs> yeah. Well, that's good. I mean, I myself picked up reading in the last couple of years too, but I also find that I want physical media more too, but I'm also like, you know, I already said my age. So I'm like in the age group of where I grew up with like CDs and like stuff like that. Yeah, right. I also collect, and I started collecting CDs again in the last like handful of years, but I also collect like vinyl and stuff too. And, um, it's crazy that like I started reading when I started reading a couple of years ago, I started doing it on my iPad because it was just like easier and you know more yeah, convenient sure. for me. But as I started going through like two years into it, you know, I started reading like the books. So it was now it's like, well, now I like, I kind of want to read a book. I want to buy a book, read it and put it on my shelf and like, you know, collect it. But that's, yeah, like, there's that's just like the horror in about, me, you know what I mean? So there's something dark about like a house with no books in it. <laughs> You know? yeah, yeah, for sure. It's like, what's the story here? Definitely. <laughs> yeah, it's like serial killer ask, you know? Well, no, I guess they could also have a lot of books, but depending on what they are. <laughs> um, so I, I asked Matt Fox what his favorite project was between Shai Halib and uh, Zombie Apocalypse. So I'm going to have to ask you, Wes, what is your favorite project? Um. It's hard. I, I should say currently. I, I would, yeah, I don't know. I mean, I care deeply about AN and Cold Gabe. It's, it's hard to pick one. Um, 
I, I don't know if I can choose one. I would definitely say I'm thankful and humbled and appreciative of AN because there would be no cold cave without it. Um, that said, cold cave sort of suits my personality in terms of not necessarily sonically or musically, but just in terms of creation. Um, I'm just a little more comfortable creating on my own. And um, I don't know. I can't pick. I'm not going to. You can't force me. <laughs> All right. No problem. No problem. And uh, I just got reminded, I meant to ask you something earlier. Um, because you were saying like your lyrics were like, oh, I, I just want to like die and like, you know, et cetera earlier and i know like you've you kind of like battled with depressions like how was it being like depressed but in the hardcore scene at the same time like because you know it's so it's meant to be so positive and uplifting you know so yeah i think it still was <clears throat> it definitely um without it i don't know what would have happened i i always sort of had a friend or two close to me um, I have like natural, I, I do have natural depression and high anxiety. Um, I wasn't comfortable in AN. I was for sure like drunk or stoned for the majority of that band's existence. And, um, that was sort of the only way I could deal with, with being put in a situation or having, um, a very self conscious person so having like that many eyes on me i wasn't something i was able to do unless i was running on like pure adrenaline or some weird like alcohol fueled courage or um stoned indifference you know so it was like without those um well anyway it, it like you said it is meant to be uplifting and mm. i still feel that it was for me even though um it was, it was difficult to me. And, um, like, you know, everything I was like saying or singing about, it wasn't, um, I wasn't phoning it in. It was, and it wasn't, um, an isolated experience or thought to the time or where I was when I wrote those songs. Uh, it sort of existed to the end of that band. And, um, you know, there's other factors within the band that, didn't help it. Um, that didn't really make me feel better, but I was lucky enough to sort of always have a close friend or two within the band and also able to always bring along a friend on tour who was, a uh, you know, uh, also a good friend to keep me company. And, you know, I sort of hung back and just kicked it with him. I mean, most of the shows after, after being in the band for like a year, spent most of the time just sitting in the van with like a friend waiting to play. Uh, I was like, you know, like when I was in high school, I, I cared so much about punk and hardcore and I started making zines. I started putting on shows. I had like a distro, um, bands stayed at my parents' house. They stayed with me in my first apartment in college. I like just touring bands. I was like the person I was, I was writing letters. I was calling people. I cared about it so much. And then, uh, the natural progression from that and from all these sort of extracurricular, but important things I did like that was to start a band. And I was so into it and I felt like such a natural release. And, um, it never occurred to me that I could put myself out there as a part of something that I cared so much about and then be like judged or criticized or like made fun of physically. It just, it never crossed my mind. And like, so uh, although there was like tons of positive feedback and experiences and praise from that, the negative aspects of that made me sort of retreat inwards in a, in a way that wasn't really conducive to being in a communal band. So it's like, it was a complicated thing for me that, um, you know, it was, it was, it was complicated. And, uh, <clears throat> I guess that's all I can really say. Yeah, it's no, yeah, I get that. And um, that was at a time when, you know, the early 2000, the feedback that you would be getting would be nil, I mean, really small compared to like if you had come out like now, 
you know, but you also do release music now, so you do, you know, you do deal with that probably too. But I guess that's because you've already kind of been dealing with it for like 20 years. So, but um, not to be the downer in, in the episode on that note, but. Uh, I'm fine it, with ending as downer. It's no big deal. No, no, it's cool. How can we end this on a positive note, Wes? Let's not. Let's just go out <laughs> down. Let's burn. Let's let's go in flames. All right. Well, we we apologize for any negative comments. This is what Alex would do. We would apo- apologize for any negative comments. Lamb goat would have uh, you know been a part of uh, you know you reading <laughs> because the comment section obviously back in the day could get brutal. So. Um, but that's what he would do. He would apologize for the comments, but anyway, it's fine. I know like, I know it was like probably nice for you for the site to profit off of, um, people saying awful things about people who couldn't help things, you know, who were born certain ways or like, you know? Mm. Yeah. (laughs) That was at a time before I was here, unfortunately. So, uh, but I would also say that the site was always, um, really supportive of um, musical projects that I've been a part of. And I always appreciated that also. No. Yeah. It's definitely it, as a viewer for many years, I was a, I was a user for many, many years. There definitely, uh, there was two subsections. There was the set, you know, there was the person that went to view the news and then there was the person that went to like troll And that was like a breeding ground for like early trolls, obviously, especially because at that, in the early days, everything was kind of anonymous. So, you know, there's always some kind of like idiot doing that. And it just kind of uh, kept going up up until recently. Strangely, over the years, like, you know, it's like, it's strange because people, I think as they get older and have a, more well-rounded understanding of life, human condition, et cetera. They have their own issues. A lot of those people who did things like that have reached out over the years with sort of um, some admission of guilt and have apologized and said, I I did this anonymously, you know, and I'm like, it's all good. Mm Mm-hmm. Back at you. Yeah. Thanks. But, you know. Yeah. Sorry you felt so bad about yourself at the time. Yeah. You know? People just lash out because they see something wrong in them. That's why. And they. Yeah. I, it, it, it is true. And I empathize with that. So, no big deal. But, uh, yeah, a lot of people definitely had their opinions on when Lamb Goat took the, com- the anonymous comments off. But, you know. It is what it is, <laughs> to be honest with you. Yeah. I don't see a negative about removing the comments, but definitely people have their opinions about it. All right. But all right, Wes. Well, we appreciate your time, brother, and uh, we appreciate you being flexible. And uh, definitely keep us in the loop for any upcoming announcements and you know news, whether it be uh, any of your projects. You know, we can definitely do what we can so again appreciate it Wes thanks for coming on man cool thank you for having me no problem man take it easy